thank you all for coming. Uh, this is another Think and Link. This one in particular is a special one because we're on a Friday and we do have two amazing guests, Emily Culp and Kathy Ireland. Um, I'm gonna give a brief introduction to them, but not much because, well, they both have really, really thorough and, and detailed background in their, in their LinkedIn accounts. And so you can see more about them. And, uh, and so they're notorious in their own ways. Um, <clears throat> this is an event that we put on uh, twice a month. We started it in our kitchen back in the first or the last recession, 2008. We got people together, had conversations, um, uh, inspired uh, views on the world, and uh, it got us through. Uh, got us through that time period, um, and then we enter into this time period, and we go virtual with it. And to our surprise, we've had amazing guests, uh, and today is no different. Um, guests that that surprise us, that they're willing to come on and have a conversation with us, uh, inspire this audience. Um, so. This is gonna be amazing. Uh, but first, a couple of words for our sponsors. Uh, one, Capsule, which is us, which is the, the special projects firm here in Minneapolis. We do a lot of work in naming, uh, brand identity, brand and design work. Um, we um, help people with really interesting challenges around brand, marketing, and design. Um, and we are in our new temporary offices here on 27th and Lindale, uh, Yellow Dog Studios. It's amazing. Um, and then our other big sponsor is Verse Chocolate, an amazing chocolate um, that you can find in the, the chat. You can go um, buy some Verse Chocolate. Um, we are huge fans of this new chocolate. They've got new flavors coming out, I believe, next week, Kelly. I Monday, hope I can say that out loud. Monday. Right? Monday, mm -hmm. launching Monday, new flavors. Um, and so those are our two sponsors. Uh, get to know Verse a little bit more. So mm -hmm. our two guests, Kathy Ireland, I don't know that I need to introduce Kathy Ireland. Um, but um, uh, if you don't know, um, and if you haven't looked at what she's done, well, she hangs out with Warren Buffett. We can start there. Um, she, <laughs> um, she turned a modeling career into an empire. Um, she has done things that um, surprise all of us. And uh, anyway, there's all kinds of things to talk about when it comes to Kathy Ireland. Um, and Emily um, has an up and coming amazing career. Um, she was at KEDS. That's where I first noticed what she was doing. And um, now she's at Cover FX and she is um, doing amazing things there. So we are going to have a wonderful conversation um, back and forth. They may ask each other questions. It may go in a variety of different places, but I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly. Uh, but before I do that, I wanna make sure that um, everyone's on mute. Um, questions can go in the chat. We'll answer them as we can. And as particular subjects come up that need a link, Thomas will put those in the link. And that's all I've got. Kelly, take it away with our first question. Great, great. Kathy and Emily, so excited to have you here. So inspired by both of your careers and, and really the business moguls that you are. So I definitely want to, to touch on the history, the origin. Uh, Kathy, I'm going to start with a question specifically from, for you and then Emily, one that's, that's tailored around your background as well. Um, Kathy, I want to talk about Kathy Ireland Worldwide, launched in 99, 1993. You know, a small business at your your family kitchen. Um, you obviously took a, a a career in modeling that I would I would guess provides a host of tough but valuable lessons. You know, for would be entrepreneurs, at a minimum, that ability to handle rejection, you know, skepticism, and really develop a true sense of resiliency. I'm sure you can certainly speak to that. I would would love to hear your perspective. Um, uh, and share your thoughts around how your career in modeling helped shape your role as an entrepreneur and now a successful, uh, successful business mogul in your own right. Uh, well, Kelly, thank you so much. Thank you to you and to Aaron. And what a, a joy to be with you and to be with Emily. My, my goodness, mm -hmm. just uh, a, an incredible leader and CEO. So, so, so grateful. And um, in answer to your question, uh, I, I loved hearing, I mean, you started at, at the kitchen table and that's where, where I began. Uh, modeling was not, um, it was not uh, part of my plan, entered the modeling industry as a person committed to entrepreneurship and both business and design were always a passion. My first job, I was four years old and I sold rocks from my wagon, painted rocks. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were multifunctional. Uh, paper route was my first serious job. And um, Aaron mentioned Warren Buffett. Uh, we both had paper routes and that was how we, we connected initially. Um, 
and, and through our dear friend Irv Blumpkin from Nebraska Furniture Mart. But the paper route, uh, my dad always said, Kathy, give 110%. If the customer expects the paper on the driveway, you put it on the front porch. So that was a foundation of learning to under promise and over deliver. And I've got to tell you still today, when our team has a presentation, if somebody does a great job, we say, you got it on the front porch. And you know, you talk about resiliency, um, worked as a model. And the entire time I worked in that industry, I was trying and failing at other businesses. And if one of those earlier businesses had taken off, the modeling would have ended much sooner. Uh, the greatest gift from that long ago career was all the rejection. And I didn't appreciate it at the time, but what a gift. So when we began with a single pair of socks uh, banging on doors and people um, slammed doors in our faces and said all kinds of nasty things, it didn't bother me. I was so used to it. So no simply mm. means now we're talking. I'll come back tomorrow. You know, maybe your circumstances will have changed. Maybe the decision maker will no longer be you. Maybe someone else will be empowered or maybe you'll be in a better mood. And, and I encourage people when you, when you get a no, figure out why, because a lot of times criticism, it, it can be a gift and it's oftentimes it's wrapped in a really nasty package. I mean, I had when I was working in the modeling industry, there were times when I, I took little acting jobs to help pay bills. And I tell people I'm not an actress, I've got the movies to prove it. Uh, <laughs> I had a, a critic once very publicly say I had a voice that could kill small animals and um, it didn't boost my confidence yet. I had to really listen to that criticism because there was some truth in it. I was 25 years old. I couldn't order a pizza on the phone. They thought I was a kid making a prank phone call. <laughs> so that's just an example of, okay, he's got a point. I've got to work on that if I'm going to be taken seriously. So I, I, I encourage people, don't let no stop you. Learn from criticism and don't let anybody put you in a box. Wow, Kathy, that's great. A story of resilience for sure and of, of just perseverance. Thank you. What a wonderful story. I think your voice is wonderful, by the way. So thank who's you. Who's laughing Kathy. now, I guess, <laughs> in terms of whoever said that to you then. Thank you for sharing, uh, Kathy. If I can, Emily, um, similar vein, but want to talk a little bit about early in your career. You, um, I, I've seen interviews. You were, you were torn between taking a, a financial analyst training program role at, at Merrill Lynch and joining a, what you called a digital startup thing that really didn't have a job description, um, but would help clients figure out new, again, TBD channel. And you chose the TBD opportunity. Can you tell us what led you in that direction and how that mindset of just taking on challenges, the unknown, how that's guided you throughout your career? It's really interesting and I feel so fortunate um, to be hearing from Kathy. I'm already jotting down a little nuggets myself. Um, there are a lot of parallels in the sense that I'm insanely curious. I love to learn consistently about a, a wide variety of topics. And for me, going back to that critical juncture, Merrill Lynch was like the safe path. Don't get me wrong. My family and everyone was like, please, this is fabulous. You know, you're going to be on the path. You check every few years, X, Y, and Z. But as I said, I'm a uh, a very curious person. I love to innovate. I couldn't see, I could see the safety of this choice, but I couldn't see how that was going to unlock my passion mm. and get me excited. And I go back to the adage, like every morning, are you excited to get out of bed and work with your team and innovate? And by the way, you're going to fail, but are you excited to push through it? And that's where the TBD job title. And I joke about this, but my whole career, I've had the TBD amorphous roles I have probably like 60 business cards because every company I've ever worked with will change my title every four months where they're like, we'll call you this now. I'm like, it's fine. Whatever you want to call me is fine. Um, so it was around the innovation. And for me being part, I could see that it was a nascent industry. This was the time just to date myself. There was no Facebook, something called Friendster existed. That's before MySpace. But I could see where this would be an amazing way to connect people globally. And I wanted to be on the forefront of that. I didn't know how, but I wanted to do that. So that was what was making it so exciting for me. And then finally, this TBD job had everything I was looking for. 
They're like, you can do designing, you can do coding, you can build a team and do strategy work. And for me, that was amazing at that young age of 22 to be able to have that opportunity to do the right and left brain. I was like, I'm in. I don't know how this will end, but I'm in and I'm excited to do it. And I always have been. That's great. So it's certainly a mindset, again, you've carried and has guided you, it sounds, throughout, throughout your career path. So thank you. It has. I think just quickly building on what Kathy said, it's also taught me um, if you start in an industry that's unknown, you're going to fail a lot because by the way, and there's no rules. So there's no guidebook on how to do this. So you have to figure it out on your own. So going back to what Kathy said on resilience and I would say creative problem solving, I'm so grateful for actually failing so many different times because then you figure out how to move forward and iterate and then really break through. Right, fantastic. That fail fast, fail forward. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Emily and Kathy for sharing. Aaron. Thank you. Yeah, so um, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that show up for this event and, and we always love to hear entrepreneurial stories and, and hear about hard and soft skills that you've developed, you've noticed that you've had in the years to be solid and, and successful entrepreneurs. Kathy, if you wanna start off, um, what are the hard and soft skills that you've noticed that you've developed as an entrepreneur, as an incredibly successful entrepreneur? Oh, th thank you, Aaron. Um, it's been critical for, for me and for our entire team to learn both hard and soft skills. And it's, uh, it, and it's, it's interesting too, because we found that our team, I mean, I, I work with an incredible team. I love sports. I'm not great at them, but I love them. And my, my sense of adventure far outweighs my sense of grace. But I love the idea of bringing a group of people together with different skill sets. Um, mm. But we have one common goal and that's exciting to me. And I learn from people and our team, I mean, we've won awards on our inclusivity and this includes inclusivity of thought. It is so boring if everybody thinks the way I do, if we're all the same, if we all look the same and we all with those different backgrounds, uh, we're teaching each other continually. And I love that. But an example is, I mean, we have a, an executive on our team who has a seventh grade education and he's got great skills in both hard and soft. We have someone who works in concierge and his, um, his skill set is is amazing and he's able to uh, bring us some award-winning designs and I loved how Emily says you know Emily you've got so many different titles all the time that's how our team is as well we don't limit people because we see gifts that they have um, we've got a, a team member with gifts in carpentry and he's now one of our leading executives so I think building all of those skills and the, the soft skills, the, the people skills, the relational skills, everybody needs those. Um, no matter what we're doing, I mean, we don't have anybody who's just working alone in isolation. We're all connecting. So we've got to be able to relate well with one another. That is a great, great answer. Yeah. Not mistaking education for intelligence. And we agree with that. Very advanced in education and still not have intelligence, right? We can have, yeah, that is, that's very elegant. Thank you. Emily, I'm sure you've got a really wonderful perspective on this as well. I have a few thoughts. It's building on, I completely concur on what Kathy just said quite eloquently. I guess for me, in terms of soft skills, there's a few. And by the way, many of these I'm still trying to hone as a person. Um, one is active listening. I think especially as you become a leader, the more you realize your voice usually in meetings should actually be the last one or the least heard. So you're actively listening. And if your voice is coming out, it's to ask clarifying questions or to draw out of the room that introvert who may have amazing ideas, but doesn't have the confidence to share openly. So I'd say active listening is one soft skill. I'd also say, I think something that Kathy and I've already touched on, embrace smart risk. I don't know if that's really a soft skill, but it's critical in whatever you do. Um, and I say smart, not just risk. It's not about embracing all risks, smart risk. 
Um, a few other ones I think are really important, one of which already Kathy said is just acknowledge and embrace um, inclusivity and inclusivity around, you know, ethnicity, education, socioeconomic, the list goes on. But if you have a diverse team, you get to better solutions in the end. And by the way, everybody's happier. Um, final two thoughts that I have. One is I really think it's important, um, especially as a leader, to be a combination of an optimist realist. You need to be that optimist when you have that failure and your team maybe morale wise feels beaten up and how to pull them through. You don't wanna paint the picture of rainbows. It doesn't matter, don't worry about it, but you wanna bring them through so they can see the light and move forward. Um, in terms of hard skills, the ones that I can't emphasize enough, financial acumen, you can't have enough of that as a leader and uh, shore it up. And I mean, beyond philosophy or case studies, I mean, truly understand the three statements in your business. Um, the other hard skills I would say uh, is around understanding legal. Um, I think that's something people underestimate once you start to lead a company, how many contracts with partners, employees, et cetera, that you're going to go through and you need to understand the nuances and not be completely dependent on counsel. And then finally, I would say be maniacal about execution and also managing your P&L, really making sure going back to that financial acumen that you are running a tight ship. It's a testament to your, what you've achieved at such a young age, those, those statements, especially those last three, the, the legal and the, the maniacal about execution and the three financial statements, the importance of those, that's really impressive. Thank you. Kelly. I'll strive for that. I can't yeah. say I've clicked all those boxes or checked them, but <laughs> well, this that's great. Really. To, I think we're all in a perpetual state of learning. And I think that's sure. that's what makes life interesting. That's my perspective, at least. Absolutely. I, I love that, Emily. I mean, I love your how you're curious and I love how you include your team and everything. And when you mentioned legal, it, you know, it, it made me think of our worldwide creative director, John Carrasco. He's the team member. We have incredible lawyers, but I always ask John to go through all of our legal documents because he's he's gifted in that. He's such a protector and he'll find things that, that, that others simply don't. And that's exactly it. And it doesn't mean that the lawyers aren't trying to protect you, but no. you have a different vantage point where it's like, I know this is important, for example, to Kathy on this element. I want to make sure that we're, we're carving that out. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That's great. Thank you both. Thank you both. I'm, I'm going to shift gears, um, a more personal discussion, but, but certainly timely and relevant when we talk about work-life balance. And I'll specifically call out Kathy, I know one of the missions, at least that I've read and, and understand to be true with regard to um, the origin of Kathy Iron Worldwide was for these solutions for families and especially busy moms. Um, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about, you're, you're both working parents um, and you know, we have many working parents on our call here today and, and realizing that, that everyone's situation is certainly unique and certainly mm -hmm. in the middle of a, of a pandemic, as we all are, how we're finding that balance, striking that balance. Um, let's talk about how you find those, that balance, um, setting those realistic ex expectations for yourself, certainly for your, for your team, and then managing those daily challenges that, that come with parenthood and, and, um, and the marriage of parenthood with, with business and running your businesses. Kathy, can you start, please? Uh, well, thank, thank you, Kelly. I mean, balance, uh, most days I don't feel very balanced. <laughs> um, it's, it's day by day. And I, I really believe it comes down to really identifying for yourself what is most important to you at that moment in time to really figure out your values and to prioritize. And for me, um, my first priority is my faith, and then it is our family, and then being of service through our business. And when I don't honor that, I'm a disaster. I mean, I'm just not effective at anything. And so I really encourage people, you know, figure out what your values are. Mm -hmm. And I also encourage people to put boundaries in place to protect them because they will be challenged. And I, I mean, mine are daily. And so you've just got to know why these are important to you, have conviction for it. Uh, so you will be able to protect it. And it means that I don't accept every, um, 
business opportunity at every moment. And, and I also can't be at every friend's party. I mean, there, there's just things we have to say no to. And I was 40 years old before I recognized that no is a complete sentence. Um, no, thank you. It sounds better, but I mean, no works. And I, I've also learned that oftentimes we've got to say no to good things so that we'll be able to say yes to great things and to recognize that our life comes in seasons and at each season, we need to prioritize our time. That's wonderful, love that, thank you. And boundary setting, it can be difficult to do. It's, it's hard when you don't want to say no, right? And be supportive, but certainly it's right. got to guard, guard that. And I think, it, I think mm -hmm. um, oftentimes for women, I think I, at, least, at least for me, I know we can be control freaks and you know, we do, we, we just want to do it totally agree. because <laughs> nobody can do it better than us. Right. So we should just do it. <laughs> but we just, it, for me to be truly efficient and productive and, um, and like what Emily was talking about bringing in her whole team, it's really good to know when and how to delegate and who to best delegate to. Right. That's great. Kathy, thank you wonderful perspectives. Emily, let's shift to, to your dear. What's your thoughts there? They're honestly quite similar. I think similar to Kathy, at least how I view it is every day is unique. And, you know, approaching life in that capacity, meaning, you know, there are some days, um, quite frankly, there might be a massive business challenge that you couldn't foresee due to weather, COVID, global pandemic, what have you. I think the most important thing then for me is level setting expectations and being clear to everyone in my family. Doesn't mean that I don't love you as you were saying, Kathy, or I can't come to this birthday party pre-COVID. Um, whatever it is, it, it's not an indication of your importance in my life. This is what's happening. I hope you understand tomorrow's a new day and here's how I'll address it. So I try and view each day in its own little sphere um, and similarly, you know, when a, I have two young children, they're eight and 11, when a child is sick, there's no usually large preparation for this. And inevitably it comes during key board meetings or something exciting. Again, it's about level setting expectations where I can do this, but unfortunately I can't do this and I need you to respect this part of my life. Um, I think something that Kathy said really resonated with me. No has been one of the hardest things I've ever learned because no, I equated with failure that somehow I wasn't able to manage my time to do all the personal professional and everything else in the universe. And now as Kathy alluded to, I actually see no as being a healthy choice. And what I mean by that is if you are, and I'll speak for myself, if I'm depleted at the end of the day, Maybe I've done all the personal and professional things I was out to do, but there's nothing left of me. I'm actually going to fail at home and I'm going to fail at work. And frankly, I'm failing myself because I may get sick because inevitably it impacts your health. So I think the no and putting boundaries around is critical. Um, the other two pieces I, I would touch on is I've gotten much better at stopping to apologize where I used to apologize for my child being sick. I didn't actually cause this situation, but I would feel guilty. And now I've realized this is a situation similar to my kids. I don't apologize when uh, China stopped shipping products. It's what it is. And here's how we're going to move forward. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I call it work life integration. I don't know if that's a better term or not, but I think Kathy astutely said balance. I mean, a balance beam means to me you're trying to get perfect. There is no perfect. Each day, it's a little bit one way or the other. So it's how you integrate and how you communicate with your coworkers and your family ecosystem. That's great. That's really Thank good. you, Emily. Yes. Integration, yeah. much better way of presenting it. Thank you. That's I don't know. It's just, how, it's, it's just how I feel because the balance piece, I'm not sure how you perfectly achieve that. <laughs> Yeah. Emily, I love what you said about not apologizing. I, I recently had people in social media call me out on it and I'm so grateful. It's such a good lesson because it, it also, it, it makes other people feel bad. I mean, if you're apologizing for that, you didn't cause it. So what must I be doing? And I think it's, it's really great wisdom. Thank you for sharing that, you know, excuse me, or uh, there's other things that can be said, but 
we can't, and then when we do, when we have done something wrong, it makes that apology that much stronger. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I will say, Kathy, at least I've done a lot of research on this because I was uh, given this feedback a little, uh, a few years ago. It is also a gender piece as well. Um, and it's very interesting too, because it's almost like you're unlearning a behavior that you were taught. And as you yeah. said, it different phrases or just, you know what, I'm going to be late to this meeting because of this. It's not, I'm so sorry, I'm going to be late, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I oh, think men, <laughs> speaking God. for a man in the conversation, yes, we tend to not apologize as much as we maybe should have or should, right? There's a, there's an awkward kind of balance there, but um, this, it is an interesting thing. It is, a, it is a bit of a gender thing, back and forth, right? Making sure As I said, I love men. To. It's just, I, I read literally psychology studies on this and I was I like, went. okay, it's not just me. <laughs> yes, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I have as well. So I apologize. Um, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about um, creative problem solving. Um, as we have um, entered into this pandemic, we've all had I'm sure, plenty of creative problem solving to do. Um, I love to get uh, first Kathy's perspective on that. It is at the core of good design is um, good creative problem solving. How have you adapted? How have you um, nurtured good creative problem solving in your organization? Thank you. Uh, problem solving. It's, it's about being relentless. And my mom's skills truly are my CEO skills. I mean, problem solving, conflict resolution skills. <laughs> Uh, I mean, that's, it's thinking on your feet. That's incredible. And that's been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, again, my faith that helps me and that just gets me um, right where I need to be with my priorities intact and having uh, just, just the faith that, you know, everything is going to be okay. Keeping a perspective and not keeping our eye on the on the situation, but looking for solutions. And we need to be calm. We need to have clarity for that. We need to look beyond ourselves. And there's always a solution. But when we, when we just have our eyes on uh, the circumstance and the trouble, it can really take us off. So I think really um, having that broader perspective and the team, uh, working together with a team when I, when I worked as a model, people used to make fun of me and they'd tell me I was really cheap and why didn't I drive a better car or wear fancier clothes? And I would share, I'm not cheap, I'm uh, fiscally frugal. And I was investing in people. And that's how I chose to spend my money and building this team together. And many of us, we've been together over 30 years now and we've got our, our Gen Zs and our millennials but it's, um, it's, it's building those trusted relationships and being, a, being able to pivot. Um, I mean, that's something, Emily, you're amazing at that. And that's something that I, I'm so grateful our team is able to do. And with, with COVID and everyone in business needing to make those pivots, we pivoted and then pivoted again. And it's not allowing someone else's perception of us to put limits on us, you know, not, as I mentioned earlier, not putting ourselves in a box or letting someone else do that, but really thinking broad and wide. And uh, Emily, you talked about listening. That's critical, listening to our customers and what do they need? How are their needs changing? How are they living? And how can we solve those problems? I mean, something that we started, uh, we launched it, at the beginning of COVID, but we had been working on it prior. It's Kathy Ireland's Small Business Network in uh, an effort to work with small businesses to help them not only survive, but thrive and scale, recognizing that small businesses are the heartbeat of our country. And that's what's really going to help turn things around. So there's, there's many things that we've been able to do. And I think it goes back to the gift of rejection, no matter what people happen to say about what they think of us, we, we move forward because we believe in what we're doing. That's great. Oh, that's, 
Thank you, Kathy. Definitely yeah. the small business piece, an important element now and very much so in our time. That's great. Emily. Um, you know, how, problem solving. Yeah, I, I think Kathy hit on so many great nuggets. I think in terms of problem solving for me, um, I will admit I oscillate between the right and left brain a lot. There, there's one side of me that's like, I want 100% of the data. You know, let's get all the data. You want a hundred percent. So then your verification that you're picking the best solution, that world does not live. That's like thinking you live inside of Candyland. It doesn't exist. <laughs> so sorry for the kid analogy, but the point is you need, this goes back to embracing smart risk and having an entrepreneurial mindset. You realize you're probably going to get roughly 70, if you're lucky, 80% of the input or data that you need to make the decision. And then the fun part, I actually think, or the hard part is trying to understand for me, um, I am very methodical in some of this, is trying to understand how did this problem happen? And what's important to me in that journey on however this problem occurred is talking to different people within the organization and possibly usually people outside. So for example, if you were launching a brand new product, it didn't make it in time to your key wholesale partner. Don't just get the perspective of your ops person. Talk to your shipping person, you know, someone else, talk to your PD person, talk to your finance lead, because usually it's a little bit more, it's not black or white. There's a lot of gray. And where that's important is not only how to solve it, but how to make sure you don't replicate the problem again in the future. Um, so once you get through that, get the full picture, then what I like to do is rank order the <clears throat> solutions. That's the fun part for me is the creative solutions, like thinking about, okay, if I had this, pe you know, this group of people in my company working on this, we had this amount of time and maybe this amount of capital, understanding none of those are infinite, how could we solve it? And then you rank order them depending on what your priorities. If you need to fix this in 24 hours, you're going to find the fastest solution. You'll rank order the choices based on that. But then you rank order them and you have a discussion with your team. That's critical too during this process of rank ordering. So then when you all decide we're going this way, everybody's on board because what you need at that point is full alignment full embracing on this and everybody understands why they're going this way, how we got here and what we're looking to achieve. Because inevitably, once you put that solution into play, you also need this whole team to be like, okay, guys, here are the three KPIs or key performance indicators. And if these don't start to click, we need to pivot again. And maybe we're gonna do option two, but everybody needs to understand that whole journey so you can win. So to me, I think the whole process is quite interesting. It depends on the stress level or the magnitude. Um, but as I mentioned, problem solving to me is also making sure you don't repeat it. It's making sure it's not a repeatable mistake. That's great. Emily, thank you. Wonderful. Oh, okay. This is such a great conversation. I, I have so many questions to ask. I'm, I'm going to shift to a a, a brand strategy question, if we can, Kathy, I'm going to start with you specific to um, obviously starting Kathy Allen worldwide, um, selling modeling socks first, and then um, presenting those socks to retailers. And obviously now this, your business has grown into this conglomerate um, that runs the gamut in terms of offerings. Um, I, I'd love for you to, to please share your perspective on, on what could be considered a counterintuitive brand strategy that has allowed you to expand this business, your business into these diverse fields that range from, from home furnishings to socks, to wigs, to workout videos, um, philanthropy. Can you share a little bit about that strategy and how it unfolded? Uh, sure, thank you, Kelly. Um, and, and yes, many people did think starting our brand with a single pair of socks was counterintuitive or, uh, Others said it was stupid or something like that. You can't start a brand with a pair of socks. Nobody had a good reason why. Uh, because of that modeling background, I, I thought, well, why don't you start with swim? And I wasn't interested in that. Um, I, was, I was interested in seeing if we could build 
a true brand that customers would connect with. It, not an endorsement, not something like that. There's nothing wrong with that, but that wasn't what I was looking to do. Mm -hmm. uh, when we, we knew that socks was going to be the beginning and we didn't want to put limits on it. Uh, fitness apparel was the next area that we went into. As I mentioned, um, my sense of adventure outweighs my sense of grace. I had been asked to leave an aerobics class because I was so uncoordinated and I was distracting <laughs> the other people. <laughs> so, um, but we knew that athletic wear was important. And for me to be able to sell it, there had to be credibility. It had to be genuine. Why would somebody buy athletic wear from me? So went back to school and I got trained as a certified fitness instructor because I didn't want to do a video and just follow along with someone else and also recognizing you can do harm if you're not, yeah. if you don't really understand the body and what you're doing. Yeah. And we went on to win five platinum fitness programs. So that was great. And that led us to um, start what is now called um, athleisure. And then there's some who would, you know, again, want to put you in a box because of past careers and say, no, well, you need to stay in beauty. That should be your little box over there, but don't go into fintech. And my question is why, you know, why, why would we not? And again, nobody had a good reason. And so, uh, so grateful that we don't listen to the naysayers and today our business has become a, a conglomerate and we do, we have fashion, we have beauty, but also um, real estate. We have FinTech. We work with um, the great team at UBS with our small business network, American Family Insurance and uh, our Ireland Pay, which is credit card processing, 51% goes to nonprofits. And that gets me excited. Everyone who partners with our company, the first uh, line of vetting is they look at our 10 nonprofit initiatives. I've worked with the, the UN with their youth program, uh, everything from fighting poverty and disease to um, a couple initiatives that our team has added is supporting our military veterans and fighting human trafficking. So knowing that in success, we're gonna make a, a powerful difference that gets us excited. Our work is never boring. And we recognize that though we're in our 28th year this year, we feel like a baby brand just getting started. So exciting to steer it, just the, tan the tangents that have come and just the different um, avenues and channels you've explored. It's just impressive what you've done. So thank you for sharing that, Aww, that perspective, you, well. Kathy, for sure. And Emily, Obviously, the role I, that you had. Yes. I, just say, I am blown away that you went and got trained as a fitness instructor. I mean, no, but Thank I just you, have Emily. to say, you know, I never, never would have thought it. But, but this goes back to the going back it, where I think that's very powerful. It goes back to something you said earlier on values and what, and you wanted, you needed to feel that you had the experience and you valued authenticity. So you could have shortcut that whole process. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's fabulous. Oh, thank you. That's right. Emily, sorry, please, in yes. that, yeah, no, in that, in that same vein, you've obviously worked with multiple brands, high profile brands from Rebecca Minkoff to, to Ked, certainly to cover FX. Through, very fortunate. Yes. You're very, and it, it's, it's amazing. You've done some wonderful things through, through um, a, a variety of omni-channel approaches, marketing, e-com. Talk a little bit about, from your perspective and experience with regard to, to brand, the importance of brand and staying true to that brand and how that helped to drive the strategy you applied in those various roles. Um, would love to hear your thoughts there. Well, I think one of the most important things to me about a brand, so I've had the opportunity to work both for like an amorphous brand like Clinique when I was at, there's no person behind that. Per se, it's a fabulous, well-known global brand. And then also at Rebecca Minkoff, and there's Becky. She's an actual person. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the more amorphous brands, such as Keds or Clinique or even Cover FX, the part that I get really excited about um, is that I think of brands as people. And mm -hmm. whether they are or are not, and I dig in to get to know that person and their DNA. And going back to something Kathy said, like, what are their values? What does that brand stand for? 
the analogy I make for my team is I think of the brand as the person, and then you're creating a dinner party. Who were the guests at the dinner party? Who, what are they going to eat? Where is the dinner party being held? Who would they want to talk to or not talk to? What makes them comfortable? Because then you really start to personify that brand and you make choices. And then you also start to make choices. For example, you know, I think we're all quite aware of the rise of TikTok or Clubhouse. Well, depending on your brand, if you're true to your DNA, it may not be right for your brand, even though it met, might be the next shiny object in a certain channel. And you make those choices, so then you're authentic. And frankly, your consumers see that because they love you, aka your brand, and will reward you and increase those sales and that engagement. So that's one of the most important things to me about branding and thinking about the omni-channel approach. And mm -hmm. it truly is about pulling it all the way through um, down to packaging or the retail store, what are the colors you're using? And it's really, I think, um, an honor and quite frankly, fun. Once you get to that little kernel of the DNA and unlocking that, I think it's, it's a fabulous thing to do. That's amazing. We, we love to hear that. I know Aaron's shaking his head. Certainly at Capsule, our efforts are humanizing brands. And understand there, there are people, these are humans, we're connecting humans and brands and, and, and really- 100%. The, right. Yeah, it's about, and I think that also flips, I think two mindsets are really important, at least for teams um, that I love to work with are being entrepreneurial, but mm -hmm. also consumer centric. Because as soon as you see your brand as a person, ergo, you realize your brand is a person connecting with people. Right. And then you're going to make choices accordingly versus this thing, a brand talking to some group of people. And I think that's one of the most important things we can do. All of us crave human connectivity. If that's one of the many lessons we've learned during COVID, mm -hmm. um, we like people for the most part. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Emily and Kathy. That's great. Thanks for sharing your perspectives. Uh, Aaron. Uh, yes, <clears throat> Kathy, you have, a, you have a book behind you, um, Ralph Lauren, and uh, it's not on our list of, of discussion items, but I'm, there's a documentary out right now about him, and it is so incredibly authentic and a wonderful view of how he stayed relevant, uh, and there's a lot of parallels to you, which are really interesting, just as I was thinking about it and noticing the book, and um, do you have any perspective on Ralph and his, what he's done and what he's accomplished? I'm just curious, because it's um, he's just an interesting brand as a whole, right? And what he's done is fascinating. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, Ralph is a tremendous inspiration to our brand and definitely someone who our team you know, just continues to watch and be inspired by the way that he's, he's grown his brand to remain relevant and expanded, um, you know, from a passion, fashion apparel into home in to all the work that he does and uh, the quality of uh, the um just every every detail which is clearly so important to him and yeah. uh how he he brings it to market in such a powerful way yeah it's a very it's impressive that's interesting to hear well okay so now my question is digital transformation which is really the, the core um you are incredibly active on social media and it might be more your team but I think it's a lot of you too. Um, it seems like some of my interactions have actually been with you when it comes to the digital environment. So what have you done as far as digital transformation? Or how has it impacted you? Or as you've jumped pretty deep into social media, um, really interesting roles. Oh, well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you. And um, yes, you know, our, our president and CMO, Stephen Roseberry, he was encouraging us years and years ago. You know, you got to get on social media. And I have to admit, I was the one who was hesitant about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, I, I feel like I'm over communicating already. When we started our brand 28 years ago, we, we started with our, our, you know, our webpage and we intentionally didn't sell anything on it. We wanted it to be a place where people could come and receive information. And also we were so grateful because at the time we, we were selling socks and while we had the doors slamming in our faces so frequently, it was 
primarily the women out there who are like, no, we're going to give you a chance. We're going to, we're going to buy your socks. I mean, the first year we were, we were still in the red, but we'd sold some. So I was excited. You know, I was, Emily talked about being optimistic. I thought, Hey, we sold some socks. Some people are getting it. So I, I love that. It encouraged me. Uh, but I felt like I was over communicating already. What I've come to learn is we were late to the game. Um, when we started on Twitter, I think I had 11 followers and, um, and most of them were team members. And so, so we've grown it. Uh, we're not a, a celebrity brand. That's never been our DNA, but it's a relationship. And I'm so grateful because the people who communicate with me and come to me, whether it's on social media or whether I bump into them at the supermarket, they don't want an autograph from me. They want solutions. It's um, maybe it's, hey, I bought this rug. What lamp's going to go with it? Or you know what? Help me with this investment mm -hmm. over here. What kind of insurance should I? It, so it's it's all about solutions. That's what they want, and they really expect it. And our customers very demanding, which I love. It keeps us on our toes. I, I mean, the utilization of our IT is unique. Um, I mean, Emily, you are a master at it. And um, our approach, it's, it's really giving uh, skills to our clients. And, you know, that includes, again, I mentioned American Family Insurance and UBS, um, Berkshire Hathaways, Nebraska Furniture Mart, and our web and our social media, they're never intended to bring uh, celebrity to our brand, just really answer our customers' questions, be of service, and and to be of service to philanthropy. That's what's what's key for us, and what makes it meaningful and critically important. Yeah, I can't imagine you had eleven followers for very long. I can't imagine <laughs> say, that I really, fairly quickly. I'm eleven followers, eleven. Yeah, and I um, love the humility in that. I'm sure I know, I know, for the two I know. seconds. I know for a few seconds you had eleven, and then you had eleven million. Um, the uh, <laughs> Emily, you are digitally native, right? You're of a, of a generation that seems like you're in it all the time. And but you've been in businesses that haven't been as digital in their, you know, they're making things, right? Um, so I'm curious how you've applied that digital native um, uh, world you come from or world you see to those businesses and those ventures you've been in. Yeah, I so thank you. You are correct. Um, that is so I started my career as we discussed like 20 some years ago, actually in e commerce before it was even a thing. So mm -hmm. some of the most, um, I would say fundamental management lessons I learned early on um, were I was overseeing MIT coders who were also ex Israeli military folks. And at 23 was trying to lead them to create an e-commerce website, for example, internationally for LL Bean. That literally, and there was no rule book and uh, this team was 20 plus years my senior. So learned a lot there. Uh, fast forwarding why I'm brought into a lot of these companies and where I get excited on these roles, whether it's Cover FX Keds or Rebecca Minkoff is I'm brought in specifically to transform the company. So that's really why I go into the companies that I do. What I'm very enthusiastic about is the business challenge. I always love to work on brands that I feel passionate. I will be honest, in general, there's usually a female founder component. I really deeply believe on championing women and female empowerment. And then usually the scenario is their uh, majority wholesale, very tiny single digits D to C, whether it's e-commerce or mono brand stores. And I flip it usually to at least 30 to 40% in under two years. And also a lot of times um, they may not have the right infrastructure, whether it's an app, the right uh, e-commerce platform, or even POS in a store because I think of the world as like a little ecosystem that your consumer lives in and so should you. So to be able to provide them the best services, it's that you understand where they're moving and how and then adapt accordingly to them. And that's where technology can be great to do those things. So that's what I infuse into companies and innovative ways to think. For example, one of um, the most fascinating innovations, at least for me early in my career was realizing if you air like television commercials, for example, Clinique was launching a 
hyperpigmentation product and had little rolling spotted eggs. It would show you, you use this, then the egg showing it would become a different color. And I was like, oh my gosh, guys, I can figure out the return on investment of this TV simply by the increase in Google searches. And then what I started to realize was we were talking about the product as in hyperpigmentation, all these different things. What people were calling it was freckles. How do I get rid of my freckles? Mm. <laughs> and then people were searching for the product, the spotted egg cream, okay? You, that is not something as a marketer that you're like, that's what I think I wanna buy on Google. But again, if you're in the consumer mindset, you're able to figure out the return on investment in two disparate channels. You're also able to glean those insights that, hey, if my consumer is talking about it this way, maybe I should actually change then my print campaign, my next TV campaign, and what I say on my website. So that's how I infuse both sort of traditional and new thinking. And the exciting part is it usually increases CAGR by 30 plus percent year over year, bare minimum. So it's fun. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's right. not boring. I go back to Kathy's line. It's never boring. It's never boring. <laughs> Keeps things interesting. No, that's great, yeah. Emily. Thank you. Um, last question before we, we close out the hour. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. Uh, so certainly thank you both. Uh, we, we've certainly all heard, I believe, um, Peter Drucker's quote that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And just on our conversation, based on our conversation alone today with the two of you, clearly culture and maintaining that culture is an important part of your respective organizations. And you've, you've certainly done a, a wonderful job from what you've shared in doing so. The pandemic has obviously shown some light on the vulnerabilities of maintaining culture when we're all working from home and how are we connecting. Can both of you share just some simple ways you've maintained culture within your own organizations um, when we're working from home and during these times? Kathy, do you want to start? Thank you, Kelly. Um, yeah, culture, it's its important. And, um, and, and I love what Emily talked about listening to everyone. And that's critical. And I everybody's had to learn how to work differently under different mm -hmm. situations. And for some people that can be really stressful as well. So just having, having a boatload of grace and, and patience is critical. And then recognizing how can we really take this situation that, um, you know, tragically so many people are, are really hurt by mm -hmm. and how can we really move forward in a powerful way? And uh, I, the staycation, that's something that's not going to go away. It's impacted our business powerfully because of our home verticals and um, just uh, being able to, to grow in areas of fintech. And uh, another company that we started since the, the pandemic is um, Kathy Ireland American Homes. And this is with our partner, Phil Bartarelli. And it's, it's American homes that are truly affordable and uh, throughout our country. And we have an emphasis on serving military families. We have you know, our luxury vacations and, and rentals for people who are needing to isolate, um, but really looking at, at every demographic and what, what the needs are. Mm. Um, you know, people extending their stays and uh, areas that uh, we have grown in uh, during this time, sleepwear, our sleepwear is up. Um, that's, that's something that, that we're using our, our great, um, partners, um, PPI, um, you know, expensive jewelry right now, but that's been going down. We've seen that yet. It's mm -hmm. still an area in which we, we work, uh, shapewear is a bit down, <laughs> um, but camping world, um, we've partnered with, um, someone who is a, a mentor to me, uh, Marcus Limonis, just amazing, uh, and camping world. I mean, they're up dramatically in stores and the stock market. People are enjoying being out in the great outdoors and what that is. So just always looking for ways, look, looking for solutions, um, whether it's the, the culture of our team and our company and looking at our customers and what's going on in their lives. How can we best be of service at this moment in time for them? 
That's great, Kathy. Thank you. It's leading with empathy and understanding that everyone's circumstances are different and how do we create solutions? Thank you. That's, that's very inspiring. Emily, do you have some thoughts to add there? Yes, I think that's the most important one is the empathy piece. Um, I think one of the areas for me that has actually been a bit of a conundrum is I used to love doing whiteboard sessions with mm. the team and you get in a room. I think it's really important going back to something that Kathy touched on too astutely earlier is you have different levels and different functions in the room. It's not just like all VP and above because you're kind of talking to each other at this point. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's important to do that. I have yet, if anyone has a solution, I've tried multiple different technologies, but there's a lag and the energy. Like when you're in your own home alone, the energy would be like, that's a great idea. Let's build on that. It's a little tricky. So one of the areas I've tried to come up with in the interim that is doing more like anonymous suggestions. I'll throw a question out and just anyone can respond with anything. So then they don't feel as judged like, oh, I must write you a perfect paragraph with like, here's my idea. Here's the right. business rationale. And I'm like, I don't want a business case. I actually want interesting ideas right now. Right. So the anonymous thing has been quite helpful to me. Um, I think another part that's been really imperative to me, at least leading during COVID, is acting. Acting on good ideas, acting on what you say you would do, whether it's around inclusivity or if it's around, you know, I'm hearing you on concerns and going back to an office, so we'll make this decision. But you have to show that you're listening and following through. I think that's even more imperative right now. Um, and then finally, one of the things I keep sharing with my team um, is it, none of us have the guidebook on where we're going right now. I mean, I can't tell you where we'll be in May. So understanding it's going to be a bit nebulous and inevitably to do great things, again, going back to this idea, we're going to have to fail. And it's okay to fail. Let's even acknowledge the failure. That's something I've started to instill where it's like, you know, I'm not gonna, it's not about embarrassing people, but it's like, look, we tried this, it didn't work. Here's what we learned. This is gonna lead to a better idea in the future, but you need to push those boundaries. I think in particular right now, because there's a tiny window right now, I think for the businesses that really figure out how to create that connection with their consumer, going back to things that Kathy was saying, like listening and coming up with new businesses, this is a huge opportunity for a business to gain market share. So if you do it well, innovate, experiment now, you will be very well set up uh, post the COVID world. Great. That's, That's very insightful. Yes, thank uh, you. Both. both of those answers, amazing and, uh, and totally unexpected. This has been uh, a wonderful hour. Thank you both, Kathy and Emily, for doing this, for spending the time with us, for inspiring our audience. Um, there are other questions that didn't get answered in the chat, and I do apologize for that. Hopefully, we can answer those in some other form. But again, thank you for spending an hour with us, for inspiring this audience. And um, I look forward to all your successes in the future and watching and admiring from afar. So, yes, Kathy, thank, very much. thank you very much. Wonderfully inspiring conversation. We really appreciate your time. Well, thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Emily. What, what a joy to be with all of you. I couldn't have said it any better. I feel beyond honored. And I have to say, you guys made my Friday. This, there, are little moments, there are little moments of joy for all of us. So I appreciate it. And I truly feel like we almost had a virtual coffee conversation. And uh, that is very heartwarming. So thank you for your time. And thank you for including me. <laughs>